This is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today we're going over the full replacement of this older mini split system with a new Cooper & Hunter 6000 BTU hyper heat pump system. Now we chose this smaller size because it's heating and cooling a very small room. And we're going to be mounting this outdoor unit on the exterior wall with our Diversitech hefty brackets because we're in a high wind location. So I'm going to show you how to do this full replacement with our Hillmore tools step by step. First thing we're going to do is open up the disconnect. You can see we're missing a screw here, but we're going to go ahead and pull this disconnect. We're going to flip it to the off position and put it back in, or in this case, you know what, we're just going to remove it. Next, we're going to remove this cover in order to verify that we have no power at the terminals and we'll also have access to our refrigerant ports. So we're going to check L1 and L2. And we have no power, we'll also check from L1 to ground, and also L2 to ground. So, so we're clear there. Now we're going to move down to our ports and do our recovery. So as you can see, we're missing a nut right here, and we don't really have to take this one off, but I just wanted to show you, uh, yeah, that's fully out. So that's, that's going to remain right there where it is. This is the one that we need access to. And this is going to have a valve core inside. So there's a little tiny uh, valve core in there. And we're going to remove that with our valve core removal tool. But if you don't have one of these and you want to recover it just as is, then you could use a 5 16 to quarter inch adapter. And it has to have a valve core depressor on the inside. And so what you could do is you could just screw that on. And then you could, would be screwing your hose on as well. And if you have a valve core in here, you'd have to have a valve core depressor and hose. So you have to know how you're connecting this into the system. So we're going to use this valve core removal tool. It's 5 16 in the front and quarter inch in the back. And then we can connect our hoses here. Uh, some of these units have a quarter inch port. In this case, this one has a 5 16 port. That's why we need a 5 16 valve core removal tool. And the reason that we are removing the valve core is because it acts as a restriction for when we're trying to do our recovery. And so it's going to slow it down dramatically. So that's why we want to remove that anytime that we're doing a recovery. So we're going to go ahead and put this in. And make sure that these are all snug. And what's going to happen is we are going to be pushing this in. And we want to fall onto the valve core, which I just fell onto it. And now we're good. And we're going to turn this counterclockwise while I press in on it in order to remove the valve core. And if you want to learn more about this procedure and many others, such as electrical procedures, make sure to check out our new book, the Inverter Mini Split Operation and Service Procedures book. This book is available over at acservicetech.com and also on Amazon. I'm going to turn this closed. And there's our valve core. Now that we removed this valve core, otherwise known as a Schrader valve, uh, we're going to hook our hose setup, recovery tank, and recovery machine in place. This is a reusable recovery bottle. It already has R4 tonight inside from other jobs. And right now we want to weigh it to make sure that we're not going to overfill this tank with the refrigerant from this system. So let's go ahead and put it on our scale here. And you can see it's reading 37 pounds, 8 ounces. Now. The factory charge on the rating plate of this system says that the unit has 2 pounds, 10 ounces that we're going to be recovering into this tank. This tank has a tear weight of 28 pounds and has a capacity of about, say, 40 pounds, like 80% of the tank. So around 68 pounds total is what this could weigh, and we're nowhere near that. So we're measuring 37, so we're only going to be increasing the weight to maybe 40 uh, as far as our anticipated amount of refrigerant in. So, we're going to go ahead and connect from the vapor port in this instance to the, the output of the recovery machine next. We're using a 3 8 hose with quarter inch ends and we're going to be connecting onto this blue side which is connected to the top of this tank. And the reason is we are connected over on the vapor line of this system and there's really not that much refrigerant in here but if we were going to pull straight liquid or we thought we were going to pull a lot, we could end up putting it right over here and it has a dip tube coming to the bottom, but it's not a big deal. We're just going to have it on the vapor side. And we're going to connect right here on our output. 
You don't have to use a 3 8 hose, you could just use a, a quarter inch hose like this, but once again you want to make sure to not have any valve core depressors in the end. Next we're going to attach a filter dryer onto the inlet in order to protect the machine and also the refrigerant. And so we're just going to mount a little extension hose. We got to make sure that this little piece right here is tight as well. So this and this are both tight and that they're not going to be wiggling loose during the recovery. We're also going to tighten this side in. Next we're going to turn this handle to recover and we're going to loosen this hose a little bit and we're going to be purging the air out right here. And so we don't want to have air get pumped into this tank. And then we're going to close this down. Make sure we turn our recovery machine on and now that we purge the air through the hoses we can open our blue tank valve and start our recovery. We'll open our blue handle and then we're going to turn this on. Now, what you're going to notice is you'll see this pressure rise now that it's off. I only pulled this down to zero, but what's happening is on the inside of this system, the liquid refrigerant is now flashing into a vapor and expanding in the, in the tubing. And that's happening in the accumulator tank that's inside here, in the outdoor coil. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to let this sit and rise, and then we're going to turn this recovery machine on again. With this particular unit, it has a check valve, so you don't have to close the blue handle before you turn this off. And so we'll just let this sit, we'll let the pressure rise, we'll turn it on again. But in the meanwhile, we'll start disconnecting the electrical wires to this system. The power's already off, so we're just going to go ahead and disconnect all this. Now this technically should be stranded wire. And also, if you did notice this, this is white, and it shouldn't be white, this should be red. Uh, in the in the whip because this is a 240 volt system so stranded THWN wire and red and black as your power wires and your ground so that all needs to be fixed. So our pressure is risen to 36 psi and we're going to turn it on again. The object is to get down to below zero psi and stay there with the recovery machine off. So as you can see, we were pulling about maybe four to five more ounces out of this system after we had pulled it down to zero and then the pressure rose. So that's why we recovered it again. Now we're just going to let this sit and we'll let that pressure rise. We'll do this recovery one more time. So we'll turn it on again. All right, so we've let this sit for about five minutes now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this to the purge, and then I'm going to open the tank back up and turn this on. And that's it. So we've gotten the remaining refrigerant out of the output over here to the tank and there's nothing really we can do about the remaining refrigerant in this output hose. I'm just going to shut this uh, valve over here but with this tank shut I'll go ahead and disconnect here. So that's it. Now we're good to open up the line set and remove the outdoor unit. So now we're going to go ahead and disconnect this and disconnect our line set. As you can see, there's no insulation here, uh, but what we're going to do is we're just going to pull this silicone, and I'm going to undo 
this nut from here and this nut from here because what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this through when we disconnect the indoor unit. So this was the condensate line, so we're just going to set that off to the side. This is the main power line feeding the electrical disconnect, and these items I'm just going to bend straight out, and we're just going to pull them in from the inside. The other thing is I'm going to disconnect this little nut here so it doesn't get hit as I try to pull this through. We're first going to take this cover off. Then we should be able to just lift this up and pull this out, including the line set and the electrical wire. We're going to take this back plate down because this is a different one than our new indoor unit. Now we're back outside and we're going to prepare our hefty brackets to mount on the exterior wall. And so we're going to take our screws right here and there's a hardware package and there's inserts that we can use in our concrete wall. We're first going to screw these in. And next we're going to take this little plastic insert and we're going to screw it in the back. And we're going to start it off with completely tight. This is in case your wall is not exactly level and you want to unscrew it a little bit in order to push these brackets up off the wall a little bit. Next we're going to take our bracket right here. We're going to put our little bubble level in. So just like that, and we can determine if our wall's level, and then we'll slide these brackets onto here. Now we can just do this with measurements and mount this ahead of time. I just wanna show you what it's gonna look like. Now, our unit is gonna be 17 and three quarters from here to here. So right about there. This is roughly about what it's gonna look like on the wall. And then our service valve line set connections are about eight inches away from the center of this foot. And so you can see right here, it lines up with right about here. So our line that's gonna be coming down right next to this. So I just like to have this centered on the brackets. So we have a mark here where the line set's gonna be coming down at, which is right about here. And so what I'm gonna do is the line set cover is gonna stop before this bracket. So I can actually come over into it a little bit. I'm gonna come at about this height. We're gonna use our bubble level and we're gonna mark it. So we're just gonna to go to the center of each of these holes. We're gonna put four, four anchors in with our four lag bolts. So now we'll go ahead and drill these out. So make sure to hold this until you're completely bolted in. So that's what we're moving on to next. And now we gotta do the ones in the back. So as you can see, our bubble level is out of level. And so our unit is out of level. I'm gonna pitch this up and I'm gonna back out our, our back piece back here. After we adjusted the second side, we're level on the top, we're level on the side, and we're also level this way. So let's move on to the next step. Unlike in our prior scenario where our tubing was straight out, some units are gonna have the connections on the lower bottom section of the unit. And in that case, you're gonna to have to take the plastic shroud off in order to disconnect the line set. And in that case, you probably are gonna just be reusing the line set if it's buried in the wall and you'd be reusing the electrical wire. You would have to disconnect that over in the front of the unit and you'd be leaving the condensate line and then you'd be reconnecting that later after you install the new unit. We're getting ready to mount the wall plate on the wall and so we're gonna be using our cardboard template and we wanna line that up with the hole and as you can see, we are very close to the ceiling. Um, so in this scenario, we actually happen to have a, a very, very high pitch. So I mean, we're going down like, like this. So now that we have this here, we're gonna have to cut this hole out later you can see two and a half inches right here to this bottom mark, two and a half, and two and a half. A couple considerations for why we want to drop this down is because you want to have good airflow getting sucked in through the top. 
You want to be able to access the filters in order to clean them. You want to be able to lift the, the shroud up. Uh, the other thing is, if we had to do the connections of the line set back here underneath of the unit, we would have to tilt the whole unit up off the wall, and this would not be enough room for that. So we just are using our existing hole outside where the the power wire is actually coming down in order to feed the disconnect through this hole out there. So we're gonna put two screws in here, that lines up with our stud, but on this side, we do not line up with our stud over here. So we're gonna put two wall anchors in here and two here, so we're gonna have four anchors total, and these ones are just gonna get screwed right into the studs. Now we're going to open the cover up in order to get access to the electrical compartment. And so we're going to need to take this screw out right here and another screw. And then we can just kind of pull this plastic cover up. Next what we'll do is we'll pop this cover up. And as you can see right here, we have a red and a black wire. These are connected to a test plug in here. And this can now be removed. So this is where our power wiring is going to be. So we're going to need to do our communication wire, which is these four stranded 14 gauge wires. And in this case, we're going to use Southwire Easy In, which has a PVC coating, which is UV rated. And this has the shielding right here in order to protect the wiring. We're going to need to come in through here and we're going to mount our connector in. Since we're not outside, we're not going to try to use the weather tight connector because it's a little bit longer. We're just going to use the snap in MC connector and that'll hold it in place. So the first thing that we need to do is we're going to cut this out with the utility knife and then we're going to cut this down to size. And this way we're down here and the wiring will be able to come up all the way over here and make it to one, two, three and also our ground which is over here. So as you can see here, this hole is not big enough, so we're actually going to need to cut this plastic off. In order to do so, we're going to unscrew this plate. And we should be able to just lift this and pull this forward. And so you can see right here, that plastic section should come off if we just cut that with a utility knife. I don't really want to be swiping and kind of like pulling down because I don't want to accidentally uh, cut anything. So then this should fit right through, so we are good to go there. Now we're going to dry fit our shielded communication wiring. And remember that this is not just communication from the outdoor to the indoor, it's also the power wiring from the indoor to the outdoor unit. So we're just going to kind of get this to length and you can see that we have plenty of room here. I have this marked with my thumb down at the bottom and we're going to pull this out. I'm just going to go ahead and mark it. I could also scrape it with a knife here, but we're going to then use our cutter right here in order to cut this down. So here's our mark. There's a little blade in here. I'm going to set this down and I'm going to hold it in place and then we're going to take that blade and what's going to happen is it's going to cut through the PVC jacket and also into the metal. All right, so we're through, and so there's our cut. I'm also going to cut down here, so we got the poly jacket. So there we go. Remember that you would not cut the, the poly jacket this far back when you're using this connector, but since we're just using this, not a big deal. We're going to put our anti-short bushing over, just like that. There it is. So we're in all the way, and then we're ready to, to put this onto our connector. So we're going to be stripping each of these wires in order to put these little crimp connectors on, and we're going to be using the number 14 on here, and we're just going to cut down and then pull away. We don't have to strip a, a large section off because it's just going to go into these crimp connectors. And we'll actually, we'll do a little bit more on the green one. The green one's going to get a circle, just like that. 
and we're gonna use our crimper right here in order to squish this down. So if you can see right here, and then we can test it by pulling on, so we're good. So you wanna make sure to see the wiring right here to put your connector, your crimper on to the connector. Test it. Another way to do this is to put this connector on ahead of time. So now we're ready to mount these wires in the indoor unit. Now we'll put this little bracket back in. And then we gotta put this screw in. It's nice to have that long Hillmore screwdriver you can fit down in there. So you only want to use a drill to, if you want to unscrew something, you would never use that to tighten any of these screws. You need to feel how tight they really are. You really want to get a good connection in here. And the other thing is this one, two, and three, it doesn't matter what series of colors it is, if it was white first and then red or, or whatever it is, but you have to do the same thing at the outdoor unit. So what we have is black for one, red for two, and white for three, and then obviously we have our ground. Now we're going to put our little bracket back in place. Make sure our wires don't get pinched. And then we'll move on to the next step. Now I just wanted to point out on this particular unit you could install a Wi-Fi adapter in this area. You could also get a separate wired remote controller that you could plug into this wire and basically you'd run that through a wall over to another location in order to mount this you'd have an extension wire with that but in this case we're just going to be using our wireless remote. Now we're going to close all this stuff down and put this back together again. Now we're going to flip this unit over and bend our line set perpendicular to this indoor unit. We're going to bend this line set up this way and the bending that's going to take place in this line set is going to take place in here in this straight part. So what I'm going to do is we have both the vapor and the liquid line right here and I'm going to have my hand right here because I want the bending to take place in this area. So there it is. And then we have our condensate line. So this is the bottom of the unit over here. And so we want this condensate line to be remaining at the bottom section. And what we're going to do is we're just going to tape this package together in order to push this out through the exterior wall. You can see our cut is right here and that should be making it to the exterior area. We're going to tape all this together. Actually what we're going to do is we'll have this cut maybe at the top right here. And this tape that I'm going to put over here, we're going to cut off because it's going to be outside anyway. But we just want it to be easy for when we're fishing this stuff through the exterior wall. Especially right here. Now if we get snagged in there, we could just tape this entire thing and just kind of wrap this if the hole was extremely tight. So if we do get jammed up, we can go ahead and just tape this whole thing. That's not a problem to try to just kind of squish it down and keep it tight. So now we're looking at the back side and we have our condensate line on the bottom. And as you can see, we have about an inch or an inch and an eighth from the bottom. So we don't have to cut our hole as low as on the template necessarily because this line is actually going uphill over into the pan. And then we just got to make sure that this has a pitch downwards as it goes through that exterior wall. So we have a, a square in our hole just to show that we do have a significant amount of pitch going to the outside. We're going to cut it down to here. And once again, you can see that we have a significant amount of pitch. Uh, we're not going to cut it down all the way because we don't necessarily need to in order for our condensate line in the back of the unit to go right out through that hole. Now we're going to be using some mastic tape to seal the upper part of that hole. I wouldn't use regular tin tape for this. You want to use this stuff that has the mastic tape just to make sure that it's going to adhere to the wall properly. We also have about inch and three quarters from the hole to the edge, so we should be pretty good to go right, right about here. We could squeegee this in order to really seal it well. Now we're going to fish our wire through our line set and hang our indoor unit. So now we're going to cut some of this electrical tape and then we're going to bend this down and we'll do that one piece of line set at a time. So to make sure to not cut anything we don't, <clears throat> we don't necessarily want to cut. 
such as the shielding on the, on the wiring. Now, as you can see with our line set pulled back, here's our, our quarter inch liquid line and here's our vapor line. We have this little red button, it's out. I didn't discuss that earlier, but that means that we do have pressure in our lines. If you want to verify that for sure, you're going to need to pull that off ahead of time and just verify and see that the nitrogen pressure comes out. Uh, but then you're going to want to put the caps on again just to protect the inside of the lines as you fish it through. Uh, there is a spring on this vapor line, as you can see here, and that's going to protect as we're bending it down. The quarter inch one doesn't necessarily need one, and so we're just going to bend this, bend this down. And we got our vapor line, and that spring's going to help it. The next thing we'll do is work on our line set, and we also have our condensate line here, which we're going to end up putting a piece of PVC up the wall into this and then we'll zip tie this all in place and we'll re-insulate the line set after connecting and after our pressure test. Now we're going to prepare our line set to be able to connect it into here. So we're going to remove these little plastic caps and inspect the flares and I would like to get this flare face a little bit bigger and same thing with here. Now we can use these nuts because these are from the factory so this line set is actually from the same manufacturer as the equipment and so the nuts are the same. So these are the ones that are provided with the indoor wall mounted unit. So we don't necessarily need these because these are the same in this case. So anyway, uh, we're gonna use our Hillmore eccentric flaring tool. And what I wanna show you is if you can see the cone on the inside, it's offset. This is my uh, favorite type of flaring tool because you just have that offset cone. And we're gonna go ahead and hook this up into our quarter inch first. So we're just gonna grab this. And I just want to give it a little bit more of a flare. That's all. Just a little bit more. So you're just going to slide this into position and inspect this. Make sure that you are in one of these little grooves. And we are in there in the quarter inch presently. And then we're going to snug it down. That's going to hold the copper tube in place. And then we're going to tighten our handle. We could just use the flares the same way in which they, they came, but I do want to add just a little bit more of a, like I said, a face to that flare. All right, that's it. So you see this little opening? It, it's not allowing me to flare this anymore. So that's going to avoid us crushing the copper tubing at the end. So that's bigger. We want to make sure that our flare nut fits over it. I don't know if you can see that, but that is maximizing the amount of space there is inside the flare nut, and it's very smooth. There's no nicks or anything like that, so that's good. We're going to do the same thing on our 3 8 line right here. We're going to want to move this nut back a little bit, make sure that we're in position, which we are, and then we can go ahead and turn our handle. I'm going to show you the entire flaring process on the tubing that's going to be connected at the outdoor unit, but this, this is really just showing you uh, just kind of tuning up existing flares. We got the flare nut in the back. Once again, we are maximizing the surface area. So as you're slipping this into the block, you just leave a little bit of space between this edge right here, well, I'll see here, 3 8 this edge, and the back of the flare in order to increase this surface area. So, so we're good to go. We can dry fit this in place in order to find our length from the uh, line set sticking out of the exterior wall down to the connection points of the outdoor mini split unit. So we're just gonna roll about six feet out on this roll here. So we would just go like this. Just hold it up against the flat surface and continue to work it out. Now we're gonna release our nitrogen pressure. That could shoot off, so I'm just letting it go a little at a time. I'm gonna work on this one. That's our test pressure, and it also keeps the insides of the line dry with that, that nitrogen pressure. Now we're gonna connect these on just temporarily by hand, just to kind of figure out our length for our line set down at the bottom where it connects to the unit. Now let's take a look down low. We'll remove this cover. Now we're going to bend this vapor line. So right here. Now we're going to tubing cut that. 
I can still see my, my little mark here that I made with a utility knife. So what I do is I snug this down, I turn it maybe an eighth or a quarter of a turn, I go around twice, then I turn the handle again. In this case, the back didn't come off, so I just kind of, just like that, wiggle it. And next, we want to get our liquid line situated. Now on this one, I'm going to cut the insulation back, because I do want to shove up some insulation up to the flare knot, because I noticed that that was not covered completely. So I'm going to be about here with my insulation. And I can push that, push that upward. And then once again, I'm going to dry fit this in place. So it looks to be right about here. This is a quarter inch OD that's outside diameter. And this other line, the vapor line, in this case, it's three eighths OD. Next, we're going to deburr the ends and also make the flares. I pushed our extra line set up forward more and we're now going to deburr the ends. And you could use the stick the burring tool, say this one right here, but I just try to avoid scratching the faces. I use this when I'm doing brazing jobs, but in this case, I'm just gonna use our round the burring tool. And so I don't wanna take too much off of the inside either. I'm just trying to, to take off just the, the extra, extra copper. And we do have the tubes pointed downwards because we don't want any, uh, any shavings going into the tube. So it looks like we're now ready to go ahead and do our flares. Next, we're gonna remove our flare nuts because we're gonna need these in order to put them on the tubing before we make our flares. Next, we're gonna take our, our nut, put that on, and you're gonna see this little silver gauge, and that gauge shows where the copper tube needs to stop at. So right there. And we're going to push that over to the side. We're going to back our nut up so it's not in the way. We're going to slide our assembly over, make sure it's in the right groove. And then we're just going to tighten this clockwise until you see this little opening here is increasing, and that's our clutch. So that's going to keep increasing until we can no longer turn it clockwise. See, it will no longer allow us to turn it. So now we're going to go counterclockwise to take this off. I'm going to have links to these tools down in the description section below, just in case you're, you're wondering about them. So you got to move the nut back a little bit in order to, to get that out of the way. And that's it. So that flare looks really nice. And it's using the maximum area inside the nut. So that's good. So now we're going to do our 3 8 next. We'll put our nut on and then we're going to put our copper tube over to the gauge. And then we're going to slip our gauge out of the way. We're also going to hold the nut back. We'll move the tool into position. Make sure it falls down into that groove. Now we're going to tighten this clockwise. And just so you know, if you're looking for any of the step-by-step -step procedures, for installing or troubleshooting mini splits, make sure to check out our inverter mini split operation and service procedures book. We have that available over at Amazon and also at our website at acservicetech.com. We have ebooks available at Apple and Google Play. We're going to back this flare nut up. And there we go. There's our flare. Now that we made our flares, we want to just check them uh, and make sure that you're fully covering over the flare face right here. So we are good with that. And let's check out this 3 8 line. And that's good there. So the next thing we want to do is torque these flare nuts to the service valves. And we're going to use the torque values right here for our quarter inch liquid line. We're going to need between 18 and 20 newton meters. And then for our 3 8 line, we're going to need between 32 and 39 newton meters. So on our digital torque wrench, we already have these programmed in, and so we can just press the, the mode, and we're gonna go to 19 right here, and that's gonna be for our quarter inch. So we're gonna hand tight our quarter inch line on first. Make sure it's lined up. And here's the other thing is that on these flares, you could use something like nylog, but if you do do something like this, you only wanna put 
a little bit right at the flare face and right at the face of the flare adapter. You don't put it on the threads, but you can also just do this dry. And you want to make sure to not get any lubricant on the threads because these are dry torque values. So we're just going to go ahead and spin this down. And with our 19 newton meters set on here, we're going to adjust this to our flare nut. And we're also going to have another wrench here just to hold on our service valve. Now you're going to hear a beeping noise get uh, faster and faster as we get closer and then I'm going to show you what our final torque value is. So it says 19.6. See it's flashing right here. And so that's kind of nice because it can show you uh, what your value is. And so now we're going to hit clear and then we're going to go to our mode and we're going to go to our number three setting which is 35.5. Remember we need to be between 32 and 39 newton meters. All right, so here we go. We're going to hold that service valve and then we're going to tighten this. So there it says 37.9 newton meters. So we're good here. Now let's move up to our top flare joints. Since our digital torque wrench is still set on the 3 8 we're going to go ahead and connect onto that. So it says 38.5. And so now we're going to go ahead and clear that and we're going to move back to our original number which is 19. And so 19 is going to be for our quarter inch. This is quarter inch OD. We're going to go ahead and tighten it. So there you can see we have 19.6 newton meters, so we're good there. Now what we need to do next is pressure test the line set. Here's our nitrogen bottle. This is our primary tank pressure, our secondary regulator. We're going to be using our higher pressure gauge manifold uh, on our Hillmore three-port gauge set. We're going to just follow the low side pressure, so it has a max low side pressure of 340 psi, so we're going to go ahead and put that into this vapor line port. There's only one access port on this system, and it's on the vapor line. And in order to do this, what we're going to do is you're going to either have to use a 5 16 to quarter inch adapter, or in our case, you're going to use a 5 16 to quarter inch valve core removal tool. We do not have these service valves open yet. As you can see, they're all the way in. They're front seated. So that one's front seated, and this one's still front seated. We would not be uh, backing these up until we're done doing our vacuum procedure. So we're just going to reach in here and grab the valve core because there's no pressure inside the tubing. We just put the, the line set in place. So I'm going to make sure that this does not get uh, any dirt or anything like that on it. And since we have an open pathway, we can use this as an open pathway to go from 5 16 to quarter inch. And because on our hose it ends, we have quarter inch there. So we don't have any 5 16 hose ends. Since our high pressure gauge is over here on this side, even though this is the vapor line, we're just going to attach here. This is only for pressure testing only that we're doing this. So we're just attaching this on. As you can see on this gauge, it only goes up to 300 PSI, and that's because this, this manifold gauge set is basically for an air conditioning unit only. We're going to take our service hose, which is our middle hose, we're going to attach that right onto our nitrogen tank. We're going to make sure our thumb screws backed out. We're also going to make sure that these are tight and our handles are closed. And so with our, with our thumb screw backed out, we're going to open the nitrogen pressure and we're reading right about 1800 PSI. We're going to put in right in here about 350. So let's just go up to say 400. So on our secondary gauge, you see that we have a pressure of right over 400 PSI. And we're going to meter this in and really uh, we're just going to put in 50 PSI first to make sure that there's no, we don't hear any obvious leaks. So right there we're at say 75 PSI actually. Now let's go up to about 340 PSI. Right there. Now with compound gauges you want to tap on them. And when you are using compound gauges in order to do a pressure test on a mini split, you do want to let it sit for a longer period of time. If you're using digital test gauges, 
then you can determine the incremental pressure drop pretty quickly because it's in tenths of a PSI. So we're going to let this sit for a little bit and we're also going to uh, put some bubble leak detector on these joints. I'm going to put these caps on because I don't want to get bubble leak detector back like in this area. So it looks like on this needle we have 337 PSI after we tapped it. You want to tap it just to make sure it's not hung up and so we're going to watch that pressure right there and we're going to apply some bubble leak detector on these joints. And we're also going to put bubble leak detector on the joints up high as well. You would never want to put, uh, say, soapy bubbles on here or anything like that because dish soap uh, can be corrosive. So you want to use non-corrosive bubble leak detector. I'm going to do the same thing up top. I don't see any leaks, but for my own benefit, I'm just going to add a little bit more bubble leak detector on. It looks like it kind of run off. So I'm just adding it on the back of the flare nut here. So we haven't lost any pressure. We don't have any bubbles forming at these joints or the top joints. We are good to go as far as our pressure test. If you do have a digital test probe or test gauge, you could just put it right here on the valve core removal tool and you just turn this to the off position and you could test right here. It's been about an hour and now we're going to go ahead and disconnect. We're going to keep this closed to make sure that we don't allow any moisture to enter into the system and now we're going to attach our vacuum setup. Here we have our Hillmore two stage 5 CFM vacuum pump and we're going to hook right onto here with our vacuum hose. So let's first attach that. We're going to be using a 3 8 hose with quarter inch fittings on the end. There is no valve core depressor in the end so there's nothing to block the flow. It's just open. So right here it's just open. We're going to put a second valve core removal tool in place right here so that we can valve off the micron gauge. Now you don't necessarily have to do this, but I like to do this just to protect the, the sensor inside from getting refrigerant oil in and contaminating it. And so we're going to use this little extension uh, piece because this is a male right here, so this is female to female. So we can open this up, we can turn this on. And you see we're at 76,000 microns. I'm going to move the camera and we're going to get up a little closer. Now we're going to turn this valve to the open position and then we're going to turn our vacuum pump on. So the object of a vacuum is to remove any air, any water from the system, any nitrogen from the system and prepare the inside of the tubes for the refrigerant. And we would allow the refrigerant into the tubing by opening these two service valves and we'll just be backing the inner cylinder up and we will be doing that with an Allen wrench. But first we need to draw our vacuum down below 500 microns and we're going to target uh, maybe around 100 microns or something like that first uh, in order to then be able to shut off this valve right here in order to read our true vacuum while the vacuum pump is off. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to get any air that's uh, surrounding these little ball valves out. So quickly close them and then open them. So once again, we are in microns. The EPA 608 guideline is to pull these systems down below 500 microns, but really we want to try to target lower than that if possible. And in some instructions, it may say to, to pull a triple evacuation, uh, but in this case, since there's only one port and since we can pull it down to a very deep micron level and prove that the vacuum is holding by shutting this valve off, we can do this with a single vacuum procedure. So we're just going to watch this as it falls down and like I said we'll probably be valving this off right down here when that's near 100 microns. Anytime you're pulling a deep vacuum like this you want to have fresh oil in your vacuum pump. If you don't have fresh oil or it's contaminated with water that you pulled out of an existing system. Uh, then it's just not going to be even capable of pulling this deep of a vacuum. But you can see it's continuing to lower. A vacuum shouldn't take a whole long time just because 
We've removed the restrictions, so it should be pretty quick in order to pull this down. If you leave the valve core in here or the Schrader valve, it's going to take a much longer time in order to pull the, the vacuum level down. And really, the displayed micron level is not going to be accurate if you have the valve core down here because that means you're measuring the vacuum outside of the system, whereas inside the system it's going to be a higher micron level, so it's not going to be as deep. Now as you pull these vacuums, any moisture that's in the system is going to get trapped in the vacuum pump oil. That's why you have to change it. And uh, the seal inside the vacuum pump is just not going to work very well if it's saturated with moisture. And so we're getting, getting close. You want to make sure that the valve core removal tools, so the VCRTs that you're using, are rated for a very deep vacuum. So you're typically looking for 20 or 25 micron rated valve core removal tools. So now we're at 100. Now we'll see how high this rises. You want to give it a couple minutes because then it's going to settle to the uh, micron level. And then from there, you want to just make sure it doesn't rise too much. If it does rise too much, uh, then you might have a leak in the system or there might be uh, water vapor in the system or something like that exerting pressure. Uh, but basically after a couple minutes here we're going to set our timer and wait 10 minutes for during our standing vacuum test otherwise known as a decay test while we have the, the vacuum pump isolated from the system. So this micron gauge is actually reading the vacuum in the system because it's still attached to it. So you always want to have this vacuum gauge very close uh, to your port, so you don't want to have it a vacuum being held in your vacuum hoses or in a manifold, like a manifold gauge set or something like that that could leak. So now we're going to do our 10 minute standing vacuum test. I'm just going to put my timer here. I don't know if you can see that, if you can make that out or not. All right, so as you can see, we rose right about, say, uh, 40, 45 microns over a 10 minute period. So we're good to go. And so I'm going to go ahead and get ready to open these service valves up. So that's breaking the vacuum with refrigerant from the system. So that's it. You don't have to over tighten them or anything like that because there's a little split ring. If you accidentally over tighten uh, backwards counterclockwise, you could pop that ring and this inner cylinder could pop right out, releasing the refrigerant. So make sure you absolutely do not do that. And then we can put our valve caps back on. And then we can tighten them in place. And what we're going to do is disconnect our vacuum pump hose. And the next thing we're going to do is put our valve core back into the port. Now we're going to put our valve core back in. So it's right here on the end of our tool. So we're going to press this forward. We're going to almost tighten it in. And then we're going to open this valve because we want to get this little bit of air out. So now we have this valve open. We have pressure being exerted right here, so what we need to do is you need to press inwards and turn clockwise. So we're going to do that until we're seated all the way. And that's that. Now we're going to turn this to the off position. And what we're going to do next is we're going to put a cap on here with a little hole in the end to see if with a little bubble leak detector to see if there's any bubbles forming due to any pressure uh, being released. And so we're going to go ahead and first open this up and then let's go ahead and put our cap in. We just want to see if we have a good seal at our valve core. So we just put this pre-drilled uh, cap on. It's a little test cap. And then we'll just put a little bubble leak detector on. And then we just need to see if a bubble is getting blown out of this hole. It's been about a minute. There is no bubble formed here. So now we're ready to disconnect our valve core removal tool from the port. 
We want to make sure to put our cap back on and tighten this in place. Always make sure to not put pressure on the service valves. And then we're going to tighten these caps on as well. So that's it. Now we're going to move on to our electrical wiring. Because we have extra insulation at the top, because I cut it real long, we can go ahead and pull this down. Now we're just going to seal all this up. And so we have our, our black insulation here. I'm going to seal our line set first. So these existing holes don't line up quite right. This wasn't level to begin with. And so now we are level. So we're gonna go ahead and put some marks in the wall and put some new anchors in. Now let's move on to the electrical. Here's our two pole 15 amp 240 volt breaker. We're gonna turn this off. We verified that the power is off at the breaker. Here's our disconnect that's in the off position. We're going to open this up. Now this is the main feed wire coming in. And so we're just going to just double check to make sure that there is no voltage. And as you can see, there's zero. And I'm going to check it against the ground. And I'll check this side. So we got nothing. So we are good. Now we did check this before we even did the job. We had 245 volts or something like that. Uh, this is a two pole breaker, but as you can see, there's a white wire on our feed. So uh, as a licensed HVACR master license holder, we are not supposed to be uh, touching the, the line side as far as disconnecting it and connecting it, but I am gonna put some red electrical tape on this because this is supposed to be one of the two 120 volt legs that make up the 240 volts. And then over here, we're gonna pull this out and we're gonna add some surge protection as well. Now that that's taped to signify that we have 240 volts up at the line feed, we're going to remove this other wire, which is an incorrect wire that was going over to the outdoor unit. So we're gonna be pulling through 14 gauge THWN stranded wire through this flexible conduit. Now we're drilling out a hole in the side of the disconnect in order to add our surge protector on and we're just going to tighten that in and we're going to put a wire bug on the ground in order to connect two ground wires so that we don't have a double lug issue where we're putting two wires under a single lug. So then once we tighten that into our lug as a single wire, we're then going to connect our surge protector wires to our load wires. Now this is not connected in series, it's connected in parallel, so the power is not going through the surge protector, it's just getting wire nutted and connected to it. And we only install surge protection on the load wires that are connected to the outdoor unit, so we are not connecting that to the line side. And to connect this in parallel, we are using wire nuts. You can use splice connectors. You can use other methods as well, as long as you don't put two wires into a single lug. Now this surge protection is there to protect this mini split system from any lightning strikes or voltage irregularities that could damage it. Now we're gonna do our connections up in here. We're gonna have the power wire and also our communication wire. I'm gonna pop these little inserts out. There's this little, two little tabs here that you squeeze, that's it. Now you see one, two, three, that's where our communication wire is going to be connected to. Remember, this is still high voltage wiring as well. And so we're going to have this connector in here. So we're going to want to cut this right about here. We're going to hold that right there. And we're going to be cutting the shielding on the outside. We also need to use our utility knife in order to remove the PVC jacket. We can get rid of some of this excess wire right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this connector here. It's a liquid tight connector. We're going to put our anti-short bushing around this metal clad jacketing. And then when we push this in, it's going to be grabbing 
grabbing a hold of our wire. I just want to make sure we're in all the way. All right, there we are. So we want to make sure that this is snug because this is a compression fitting in order to make sure that no moisture gets in into our wiring. And what we want to do now is we want to take this nut off and we're going to take this nut off in order to slip this into our case, into our shroud. This is 14 gauge, so we're going to put it in number 14. Then we're going to crimp this in. So we can just slip this right here and we'll use our crimping tool. All right, so that's nice and tight. And we can put it right underneath here. And this wire right here, which is part of our communication wire, that's going to go down on the bottom right down there. Let's finish our power wires. It doesn't matter whether the black goes in L1 or L2 because they're both power legs for the 240 volts. And then the order for 1, 2, 3 is the same as it's wired at the indoor unit. So number one was black, and so we'll crimp that one in first. Next was red. And finally, for number three, it's white. So we're going to pull each one of these wires, make sure they're all snug, everything is good. We're going to bend our wiring upwards in order to then connect this in. We just want to make sure that nothing has tension on it. Now we'll add another zip tie onto this, onto our wiring, and also we'll put one clamp on our seal tight on the exterior wall. I just wanted to point out that I put some zip ties here and here just to seal the ends to make sure to avoid any moisture from getting in between the insulation and the copper tube, just to avoid any possible future corrosion there. So we're going to go ahead and put our cover back on now. Now we're going to turn our breaker on to our mini split. So we're getting ready to turn this on and we're going to take it from the off and we're going to put it on the on. And also I want to point out that these fuses are old. They're going to have to get replaced, but we're just doing the startup right now. So we're not going to put this in all the way. We're going to put it almost all the way and then we're going to shove it in. And so now it's on and we also have our indicator light signaling that our surge protector is intact and ready to protect the system. Now let's move to the indoor unit. So now we're ready to turn it on. So we're going to turn this to air conditioning. So we're going to set it to cool and turn the temperature down to 70 degrees. Now we're going to control this with our wireless remote and we can install this bracket somewhere on the wall. And we could also control this with Wi-Fi as well. So if we were to plug this into the inner section, we could control it with Wi-Fi. So either way, so, so now we're running. So I hope this video has helped you understand how to install and how to replace an existing mini split system. If you're looking for any of the tools used in this video or the equipment used in this video, I've got links to that down in the description section below. And also make sure to check out our Inverter Mini Split Operation and Service Procedures book. And this book goes through installation, troubleshooting, refrigerant side and the electrical side. So make sure to check this out over on Amazon and at our website at acservicetech.com. And we also have free resources there for HVAC technicians in the field. I hope all this helps and hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.